uh, Sue and Wendy are in the meeting and I'm turning my microphone off. And so Ron, we'll, we'll catch up after the meeting. Thank you. Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, this is Thursday, April 23rd um, for another hearing from the General Housing and Military Affairs Committee. And we are going to get right into the conversation about S333. We had a long conversation yesterday. There were some bumps in the road on our way to finalizing this bill. Um, we have with us today the same folks we had yesterday. We have representative um, from the Vermont Legal Aid, Wendy Morgan, um, representative from uh, an, an attorney who works on bank foreclosures. Um, Sue Steckel is here as well as the attorney, as well as David Hall. And so um, does everybody in the 17 minutes that we've been since or less than we've, since we checked out of the last meeting, um, has anybody seen the material that we just emailed out so that we have, uh, um, um, I, so I just want to get to the microphone with with Wendy um, first and then Sue to talk about the compromise of the compromise, you know, th this is the correction. This is where we thought we were 24 hours ago. Um, so they've, they've come to a, a compromise on this language that I do think is probably a little clearer and gets to where we both want to be. Um, Lisa, do you want to chime in before we get going? Is that... Yes, if you don't mind. Um, I have seen the material. I have not had time to digest it. I don't know that more witness testimony is going to make it clearer because yesterday it certainly did. Um, I liked where we were on last Thursday or Friday, whenever it was that we ended with this. Um, I understand the fact that we need to include mobile home residents in this bill, but to keep adding and adding and adding to this and narrowing down the focus um, and rushing it out so that we can vote on it in the full house next week is not where I wanna be going with this. Um, so I also, I'm taking really, um, I'm trying to be patient, but the fact that other people are writing this bill for us, it just really goes against what I feel we should be doing in this committee. So that I'm, um, that's what I have to say, and I'm, I'm feeling now really rushed and pressured to get this out, and I'm, I'm not fully understanding all of this. Thank you. Well, that's, that's fine. Thank you for sharing. Um, the fact is we've been working on this for a long time. We are writing this with the advocates. This is information that we have, I, I mean, if I had my druthers and if we were doing this in 3D, this would have been done three weeks ago. Um, the fact that facets keep popping forward, it's our job to act and think pretty quickly when these things come forward. It's not easy. Um, this is, this is information that, um, you know, we will, I invited the witnesses back because the language is sufficiently different. And I would ask of the witnesses to be as concise as possible um, moving forward in the next, I, I, would, I don't want this, I don't want this particular meeting to take an hour, but I don't feel that there's a rush on, um, you know, I, I will take the other stance that we've been working on this for a long time and we need to get this across the line. There, there are Vermonters who need this kind of protection as soon as we can possibly get it to them. And we will make a decision after we hear the um, after we hear the testimony from the witnesses on the new language, we have several choices. We have, um, they're all amalgamations of the stuff that we agreed to last week, which is broader language and includes the mobile home stuff. David had provided those, those options up on our website and we will, um, we will go through them and, and, we will, and we will make sure that we understand them as best as we can, but we've been working on this for a long time. I understand we've been working on this a long time respectfully and that's why I'm asking to not have all of these changes last minute because we have to get it out for next week's vote. We were set on this last week and I understand the mobile home thing and I do understand that we have to pass something and get it out to people, but it doesn't have to go down to this level of detail to help Vermonters. Um, the broad, the broad brush. All right, so if that's, but if that's, if that's where you are when we, after we hear this, this testimony, that's fair. That's your vote. Okay. Um, and that's what you're going to be comfortable with. And, and that's, I, I'm perfectly fine with that, but I'm going to, I'm going to move us a little bit forward and, and get going here. So Wendy, please, you can start. And as I said, I'm just trying to, um, 
if you can just tell us a little bit about what what you've worked on and um i don't know actually uh david i'm sorry i'm gonna ask i don't know how are we gonna do this technically can david put this up on the screen and wendy talk mm -hmm. david can you yeah okay thank you sure just which version are we looking at? Okay, David, if you could chime in and just show, tell us what we're looking at here so that we can, um, this is, so this looks, this looks like to me that the language that they, this is the confusion language. So, so we see on line 12, actually, David, I'll let you explain this if you can. Um, and just, and then Wendy and Sue will chime in and talk about what B and little one and little two are. Chair, I'm sorry, it's John. I just need to know where in draft 3.1, draft 4.1, or Susan Steckles language recommend. I don't know David, what. I'm looking at, um, David, can you clarify, please? Which I hope you're seeing on your screens, which I am sharing, is um, draft 4.1. 4.1, thank you. Is everybody seeing draft 4.1? Yes. Yes. Great. And so now, David, can you scroll down on that? I'm seeing just the top half of page one. Okay, so Wendy, can you just go ahead and say this is this is the language that was provided um, through Sue Steckel, and but it was this is the agreement um, agreed upon language um, from legal aid and from and from the bankers. So Wendy, if you could just take us through this, this kind of combines what both of the things that we were talking about. So can you start, please? Yes, thank you very much, Wendy Morgan from Vermont Legal Aid, for the record. Um, so you will recall that our concern was with the word that is occupied and the concern that not everyone has the same definition of occupied, but more importantly, that there some, could be some residences that are still occupied, but where the uh, tenant is no longer or the resident is no longer in the residence because of maybe they're hospitalized, maybe they're um, sheltering in place with somebody else, caring for somebody, somebody caring for them, whatever. So um, B, B is an explanation of what is going to be, if you accept it, uh, not, for purposes of this act, a dwelling house is deemed to be occupied unless all of the following are true. So this is basically a definition of what is not occupied. When, when the uh, court could find that the residence is not occupied. And one thing that this provides is some very specific um, messaging to the attorneys who are representing the um, mortgagees that um, these are, this is information that they should be supplying to the court to determine whether or not it's occupied or not occupied. So this actually tracks or not exactly tracks, but is is uh, parallel to the abandonment statute in landlord tenant law when uh, a property is deemed uh, to be have been abandoned by the tenant. So this is sort of similar to that. It's it's not exactly the same, but it's similar. It's particularly, excuse me, similar in construction. So it says that a dwelling is deemed to be occupied unless all of the following are true. So little i is that there are circumstances that would lead a reasonable person to believe that the dwelling house is not occupied as a full-time residence, including evidence that utilities are disconnected, mail is not being delivered, or the dwelling house is empty of necessary household furnishings. So if there's just trash, that's not furnishings, but if they're furnishings, then you can't, can't say that it's unoccupied. Number two, that the mortgage in the dwelling house is not current. That's going to be pretty standard because you're not going to bring a foreclosure action if, if the uh, mortgage is current. And finally, three, that the mortgagee, the, the person who's holding the mortgage, has made reasonable attempts to ascertain the mortgagor's residence and has a reasonable belief that the dwelling house is no longer the mortgagor's residence. 
So in that case, the, the um, mortgagee would file an affidavit with the court that says, I tried finding this person, I asked the neighbors, they told me he was in jail, I checked with the jail, yes, sure enough, he's in jail or whatever it is. So that, um, uh, actually, if the person's in jail, they may still be a resident. But if somebody's moved to North Carolina and they've found the person, they've communicated with the person, then obviously the court will say, okay, the person's agreed that they're living in North Carolina and they're not um, available, not living here. So number two is the mobile home park resident, which I think you all said that you had no problem with yesterday. And number three is during the emergency period, which is language that came after the effective date of this act, uh, which came from David. So that's what you have in this proposal here. Um, okay, I'm gonna go to Sue now. Um, Sue, is that, is, is that what we're talking about? Or again, are we in agreement between the two of you? Are you in agreement that this is the this is language that you agree on before we consider this as a committee um, to go? Yes, absolutely. Um, we are in agreement. Um, I think this language um, provides the comfort level um, that legal aid has been seeking. It gives good guidance to attorneys as well as to courts. Um, as to some of the factors that they should be looking at and the information that should be provided to the court with the filing. Okay, do we have, um, and um, the, David, do you have any, do you have any um, um, legalistic questions or comments or editorials on the language that was provided? Nope. Okay, Representative Triano. Um, hold on a second, wait. Um, Representative Hango first. Thank you. Um, I guess this question is for either Wendy or Sue. Where did this definition come from? And is it a, a, a mutually acceptable definition throughout the judicial world? By definition, I'm asking about um, the definition of unoccupied. Well, I think, well, we can go to either of them. Um, this is, again, as a reminder, this is language that that is only, it's a session law, it's not changing underlying statute, and it's what's going on for the um, length of this particular, uh, this particular crisis. I'm so asking, once this crisis is over, but, but, but the, the attorneys can weigh in on that as well, if, they, if, if you like. I'm asking specifically for small letter I, the circumstances that would lead a reasonable person to believe that the dwelling house is not occupied as a full-time residence. Where did that language come from and is it accepted throughout the judicial community? The concept of, a, of, of what would lead a reasonable person to believe? Um, no, not the concept of, but the whole small letter I, who, who thought this up or is it in a definition some, is it a definition somewhere of a non-occupied, unoccupied dwelling? It's very, it's similar. The first half, I don't know if it's word for word, maybe David can check while we're talking and I'm, I don't recall the exact language for abandonment in the landlord tenant law, but the first part of that, my recollection is, is almost exactly the same as uh, current landlord tenant law. And then we added the um, evidence including, so those are just examples of things that could show the court or could lead a reasonable mortgagee to say, okay, this person is not living here. And I, if, I, if I may add to that, um, I think those are examples that are typically used by foreclosing attorneys um, in a pleading to demonstrate to the court that yes, this is an unoccupied property. And those are factors that the, the courts like to see. Um, there, could be, there could be many others, but I think those are good examples. Can you still hear me? Because for some reason my screen disappeared. Yes, we can hear you. you. Yes. Okay, so I can no longer see. Um, and I'm sorry I missed Sue's answer. 
because for some reason I'm in the join a meeting again. <laughs> uh, I will try that again. <laughs> can you hear me now? Yes. And just, and just to be aware, Lisa, we can actually see you just fine. Huh, that's really interesting. So I'm not sure oh. what's going on because I'm at the screen that wants me to join a meeting again and I can't, I don't have any click on view video or mute and Lisa, unmute. Lisa, are you on your iPad or on your computer? I'm on a computer. Um, so can you, are you on a Windows or are you on a Mac? Windows. So there should be something on the bottom of your computer screen that you can click. I'm not as familiar with, with Windows, but that will show you all your different applications that are open. And so that's what you could possibly see to try to find something to find where, where we are. Yeah. Do you, see a little, you, do you see a little camera at the bottom of your screen, a little blue camera? Um, no, I do not, Ron. Okay. And thank you, Deanna. I'm not seeing what you're referring to. Another option, Lisa, is to maybe minimize your major screen and it might be hiding behind it. Ah, it might be. Hang on. Ooh, I think I think I'm getting there. <laughs> yep. I'm the there. guy the lives you Sorry leave about that. I apologize and please um, go ahead, Sue, if you wouldn't mind. Um, I, I don't think that there is a standard accepted definition um, of unoccupied for the Vermont judiciary, but um, B, small i, as proposed, suggests criteria that um, in the past, both um, foreclosing plaintiffs, attorneys, and courts have looked at in order to make this determination. Thank you. So I guess my question is, if it's generally accepted by the judicial community, why we need to spell out all these different um, scenarios? I, I, can, I can answer that. I think it, it helps to give guidance, perhaps to um, attorneys who are less experienced in this area, um, um, or who may tend to take shortcuts. Um, in terms of vacancy. It, it's giving suggestions both to the attorneys and to the court of things to look for rather than just a blanket statement, this property is vacant. So my, um, thank you for that. So my um, recollection when we spoke with Judge Gearson that they, they were right on this. They didn't have any such concerns. So I'm going to stop asking questions now because maybe Representative Troiano wants to ask some judicial type questions. Thank you. Thanks. Am I recognized by the chair? Hello? There you go, you're on. Okay. So um, I, I, I do wanna comment that um, the reasonable person standard is um, widely used throughout the legal system. Um, criminal law, civil law, and we're seeing it here in, uh, now in, in uh, landlord tenant uh, law. Um, I'm not a big fan of it because what's reasonable to someone is not particularly reasonable to me maybe, but it is well used. And uh, in fact, uh, over 35 years of challenging it on occasion in court, um, uh, have lost every time. <laughs> so, so I can say that, um, you know, I think, I think this language clarifies some of the issues that some of us, I, I think, including me, have, were having yesterday as far as, um, as Sue said, giving some guidance to the court um, and to the attorneys um, and, and, and language that is actually beneficial uh, when you're uh, when you're creating or writing law, that it does um, give uh, possibilities or or examples of what um, it is that we are looking for um, in order to make a determination whether a dwelling is occupied or not occupied. That's what it says to me. Um, so um, that's just a, a comment. Okay, Representative Kalaki. 
Well, what I'm what what I'm struggling with is that um, the the intention of the Marcotte. Uh, amendment, which we all kind of like to make sure we understand that it has to be occupied. As we're drilling down, I don't know if it's making it better. And if landlord tenant law already recognizes abandonment and that it's it's within this framework, is this clarifying it or is it making it um, more diffused in a way? And is it better to leave it more open with the Marcotte thing and just add in the mobile home uh, element and and I, I'm not sure in this refinement that we're actually getting a better bill out of it. Uh, I think leaving it more wide open for the, the courts, they already have landlord tenant law. And if all this is in there from what I'm hearing from um, our witnesses today, I, I, I just don't see where this is getting us anywhere better with the intent of what we're trying to do. We're trying to protect people in their homes. And so if everyone thinks this is better, I'll go with it. But I, I think we got pretty close with the Marcotte Amendment myself. Um, Representative Triano. Yeah, I, I, I'm i just, I'm not going to comment. I, I disagree, John, with that, what you're saying. I think this um, clarifies the situation to a point where it, uh, it, it, um, it, it, it makes the, uh, the bill a lot better. All right, but good. That's awesome. All right, any um, further questions for the witnesses? Because then it's just going to be up to us and we'll have several choices to to hash out and we'll try to, um, we'll try to hash out. And I don't, as a, as a, hopefully I got across, I may not have gotten it across as clearly as I expected. I wanted to, but again, this was just language that came across our transom um, 45 minutes ago, basically, or an hour ago. And um, prior to that, we were basically at a point where the language that was put on our website uh, and that was shared with the committee earlier was basically, um, I mean, it sounds like we don't have a problem with the, uh, what we just saw as a third instance of amendment, which was the time frame, um, we don't have a problem with adding mobile homes. And so the question is, the, the question really comes down to this slide. I think we can probably assume that it's between the Marcotte amendment, which simply says, which David actually, um, if David, if you could put that up again, um, if you could put up what was on this, uh, what was on our website for today, um, there were two, there were two different amendments that David had prepared for us to consider like me to put um, the one that that is um, where you rewrote the Marcotte amendment, basically, um, where you changed it from which is occupied to a different version of um, of using unoccupied, I think is what you did, if I'm not mistaken. There were two, there was one that was more representative of the Marcotte amendment, and there was one that was more representative of the language that we discussed yesterday. Are you seeing it now? Um, yeah. So this formerly said, which is occupied, the yellow text, yeah, you know, with, under the Marcotte, um, the, the Marcotte Amendment was comma, which is occupied, period. And this was something that you developed yesterday or tonight or this morning, correct? Yes. David, what, what version is this? 2.1. What? 2.1. Thank you. So this still is a fairly broad um, broad definition. It does not narrow it down um, in the way that the language that we heard specifically today 
does. I mean, we're gonna. I'm gonna ignore the. Inf I'm gonna ignore the language that we heard yesterday and treat today's language as what we. It's it's basically. Um, it's basically this language or the language we just heard about is, or, or we can go back to just simply, which is occupied, which is the simplest, which is the simplest version of, of this. Um, I'm going to unmute everybody who wants to be unmuted. Could I I'm sorry, go ahead. Could Who's I respond this? to, this is Wendy Morgan. Could I just respond briefly to representative Kalaki's comment? Um, yes, and just from a It'll technical, yes, just from a technical perspective, Wendy, do you know where the raise your hand thing is? No, I have no idea. So on your Zoom screen, do you, do you see at the bottom of the Zoom screen, it says participants? Does it say participants? Yes, yep. All right, and then if you lift it up, it should have on the bottom of that, it should have a thing that says raise your hand on the right hand side at the bottom. Raise that, hand, yep. So if you can do that, that would be, then I'll be able to see that you that you want to chime in and look, oh, look, Wendy, please go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that the language is in the landlord tenant law, but this bill deals with both landlord tenant law and foreclosures. And so this is putting parallel language for foreclosures. That's all this section is doing here. Uh, so I guess then I have a question. Hey, um, Representative Triano had his hand up and then okay, I can I come back to you. Are we doing blue hands now, even though we're unmuted? Uh, actually, that might be help, still helpful. Yes, just just so that I know when people need to to chime in. So, um, so Chip, go ahead and then we'll get to you, Lisa. I just want to finish up um, on the piece that we had just looked at that um, uh, that uh, when, uh, after working in statutes for so many years, um, it is lack of clarity sometimes in the work that we do that uh, precipitates litigation. Or So, uh, you know, it is, again, my opinion that the more clarity that we can lend to, um, to the courts and to the uh, litigants, and, and keep in mind that we have, we will, we're looking at a situation in which uh, many tenants um, and even and even property owners um, are not represented in the in these situations. So, the more clarity you you can provide, uh, I think the better off we are in creating uh, law. Um, and that comes from my experience in and again uh, in seeing that uh, you know vagueness is what uh, brings on litigation more often than not. And, and, and those who are not able to properly litigate a situation, uh, such as tenants and landlords, um, are at the disadvantage uh, when things are more vague. Representative Hango. Um, so I guess then my question is um, maybe for David, what does... Um, what do the laws around foreclosures have to say about this if we're told that ten landlord tenant law has language like this is there nothing in foreclosure law and i guess for now that's it um i would have to look back at chapter 172 i don't i don't know off the top of my head um but sorry that's okay. And my other question had to do with um, abandonment. Is it the same thing as an unoccupied dwelling? I don't, in my mind, abandonment is not the same thing as unoccupied. And I don't know who wants to answer that. Um, well, so they're, they're definitely just different uh, terms for the same concept, I think. I mean, the, the, the reason we're referring to abandonment in the context of um, landlord-tenant law is because there's actually a, a specific section in Title IX about abandonment. And the reason that um, the reason that that section of law exists and there is a standard for what it means 
for a residential rental unit to be abandoned is that it, it what it does is trigger requirements on the property that's left behind. Um, I, I feel like this is probably, gosh, 10 years ago now, um, but there was, uh, there was kind of a significant debate about who has the responsibility for property that is left behind when a tenant leaves. Is it trash or is it personal property? If it's something that needs to be saved, who has to pay for it? What do you do with it? And all those duties are triggered by whether or not the property has actually been abandoned by a tenant. And so that's why we have a standard currently in landlord tenant law. I mean, truthfully, it's a, it's a, it's, there's not really a, a comparable circumstance right now in foreclosure law because there's a fairly objective standard over whether or not you're going to go into foreclosure. And that is, you haven't paid your mortgage, right? Um, and th th I think that the this bill, you know, is reflective of the exceptional circumstances we're in, where somebody might not be physically occupying their residence, but they uh, are not necessarily abandoning the residence, even if they're behind on their mortgage, there could be exceptional circumstances for why they're not there. Um, so, you know, I think the chair has it right when he says that uh, as far as the Marcot Amendment goes, this really is the same standard. It is the broader exception to the foreclosure moratorium. I mean, the way that this language before you will function is that S-333 will not apply in foreclosures against unoccupied properties. The new language, as Representative Troiano has suggested, just puts some shape on what we mean by a property is occupied or unoccupied. Well, how do we know that? By having it in this bill, you give direction, you give schema to litigants and to courts about what are some objective criteria concerning occupied or not occupied? It doesn't change the status or the scope of the exception. It just puts more shape on what we mean by that term occupied. And you know, the words that are being used in this proposal happen to mirror the words that are used in 9 VSA 4462 which relates to abandonment of a residential rental unit. Okay, Representative Kalaki. Well, I appreciate it, Wendy, your, your uh, clarification for me. I, and I, you know, I listening to Chip as well, I, I kind of like the clarification in this, this new language we're seeing. And I think it just refines the bill and the intention that the Senate sent to us. And so I'm, you know, I, I was earlier asking questions about it, but I, I think it's stronger. So I, I'm with Chip on this one. Is that, are you, are you talking about the language that was presented today or language yes. that was um, yes. from, from, from legal aid? Today. Yeah. Okay. The new language. Yes. Okay. Um, Representative Gonzalez. Wait, wait, wait. There you go. Sorry about that. That's right. um, uh, so thinking about that 4.1, it feels like we've had a lot of conversation about this and um, and uh, I would like to call the question uh, to see if we could vote on, so I move um, if we vote on um, S333 draft 4.1 and move us along. All right, so we have a motion on the floor um, to accept amend, um, amendment draft 4.1 to S333. Do I have a second? Second. So, oh, okay. <laughs> so Matt's, Matt's seconding. So I'm going to, okay. so I'm just going to pause here for a second. I'm going to mute y'all up for a second. And um, we're, we can still continue this conversation before we vote, but I just want to make clear, Mary, are you ready 
to um, are you, we are we own the bill now. So votes that we take on the bill now are going to be recorded as as votes. So this is a this is a vote um, to accept Amendment 4.1, which is accepting today's language plus the language of the mobile home and the time frame um, to go into the Senate's versions of um, S333. And we're essentially, I would like to have this vote on this particular amendment as it's been proposed and then basically go back to S333, which we would then be saying that we're concurring with, when we present this on the floor, we'll be concurring with further amendment. Um, this is the further amendment that we're we're contemplating now. So, um, Mary, do you have um, the material that you need to have when we're ready to um, call the call the vote? Can you unmute? Um, I will have to look it up here. Okay, and Ron, but I do. Ron had sent me the call sheet, but I'm going to have to. Um, right. So this this vote when we have this next vote, it will be on. It will be on version 4.1 of, um, right. of these amendments. Um, did you have a further question, Mary, on, for your hand? No, I was just going to second um, uh, Representative Gonzalez's um, suggestion. Yeah, OK. And then, and, um, Tommy, you had your hand up before. Um, so I just want to make sure I understand what we're voting on. Now I'm a little confused. <laughs> Are we voting on the amendment as we heard amended this morning or on the entire package? No, we're we're hearing we're the vote that was the question that was called by Representative Gonzalez was to vote on version 4.1, which is what we just heard about from uh, Wendy Morgan and Sue Steckel. So that language that that was introduced today. Mm -hmm. um, not the not the versions that not the versions that legal counsel provided this morning, but the ones that were just provided this afternoon. Um, okay. And are, are um, we voting just on the amended language or on the entire bill? No, just on the amended language. Okay, I, just, I, I don't want to. I I want to. I want to keep. I mean, this has been fairly contentious, and I just want to make sure we're straightforward on on this right. particular language as it's been as it's been moved and seconded. Representative Hengo. You need to unmute. There you go. Um, so you sent us an email midday, um, Mr. Chair, that spelled out four different scenarios. And my understanding at that time was that we were going to have the opportunity to vote amongst ourselves, straw poll or whatever, on which scenario we liked the best to amend S-333 as it came over from the Senate. And then lo and behold, while we were in our House floor session, all of this other language came through. An amendment was written that we didn't have any input into writing the amendment. And now the question is called that we are going to vote on that amendment. I'm not comfortable with this process at all the way it went because I actually spent my lunch hour reading your email um, with the four scenarios. And I had decided in my mind which scenario worked best for me and my constituents. So I'm a little um, disturbed at the um, quickness that this is going by and you know, the lack of opportunity to craft an amendment of our own, so to speak, in this committee. Thank you. Okay, point taken, thank you. Um, any further comments right now on the, um, on, on um, version 4.1? Okay, seeing none, um, clerk can commence the call of the roll. Okay, um, Representative Walls. Yes. Representative Gonzalez. Yes. Representative Long is not there. Representative Gamash. 
Representative hold on a, wait, I'm sorry, hold on, Mary, please. All right, Representative Gamash, your vote again, I'm sorry. No. Okay. Um, Representative Troiano. Yes. Mm -hmm. Representative Howard votes yes. Representative Kalaki. Yes. yes. Representative Zott. I'm sorry, we're gonna one more time. Hold on, Representative Zott. Just a minute. Can you okay. unmute? Randall, can you unmute? Here you go. Representative Zott. I can hear you. I didn't hear you. Can you give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down? Okay, thank you. Let's say yes. Yes. Uh, Representative Byron. Yes. Representative Hango. No. And Representative Stevens. Yes. Okay. So we have Are we gonna wait for Emily or? No, she's not here today. Oh, she's not here today. No, she okay. won't be coming in. Okay, so we have eight, yes, two no, and one absent. Eight, two, one. Okay. And um, if there's no further conversation on the bill, the next vote would be to, excuse me, if someone would make a motion to, um, to concur with the Senate, to concur with S-333 with further amendment, is the, it would be the motion on the floor. I move we concur with S-333 as amended. Concur as amended. Okay. Do I hear a second? Second. Who was that, Representative Kalaki? Yes, yeah, second. Okay. All right, and I understand this has been really, you know, it's been hard and it's been, in this particular section has been contentious and that's fine. That's, this is, again, it's been quite a while to work on this bill and we really need to get this this universe this standard out into the world i mean it's clear i've you know i i personally received emails from the southern part of the state in in, in uh counties that may not have been that don't have this coverage yet or this kind of coverage yet and um and from others who are concerned that that these issues not just what we were talking about today but the the larger issues um need to be homogenized across the state. They need to be standard across the state. And this is what this bill um, attempts to do for this particular crisis. It does not change the statute, the underlying statute. None of these changes will continue on once this crisis is over. And I think that's an important piece of, of, this, um, of this legislation. Um, Representative, um, hold on a second. Let me see who's first. Representative Hango. Thank you. I just want to be very clear that I am totally in favor of helping all Vermonters and um, the bill that we had crafted last week with the exception of mobile home residents was a fine bill. Um, the amendment to it, which was the Marcotte amendment, worked well. Um, I am disappointed that there was not an opportunity to discuss the email that Chair Stevens wrote to us today, this morning, that um, outlined several different possibilities and combinations of case one, two, three, or four, or amendment, whatever you want to call it. So um, I really regret having to vote no for this, and it's quite painful for me. So um, I just wanted that to be on the record. Thank you. Okay, Representative Kamash. Hold on a I, second. Lisa, yep. Yes, no, I was You're only good. to add to what Lisa has just said. 
how is this bill going to actually read? What exactly is going to be in it at this point? Uh, so it will be it will be what the Senate passed to us, which was language that we developed for the most part. Right. And then there are three instances of amendment that we just voted on. Right. So that's what's that's this that's what's in the bill. So it, it basically does not deal with any job protections of family leave, which we had discussed that did not come back over in S-333. Um, it does not have any information on homelessness protections or funding. That's going to come from a different, that's going to come from a different angle. And so the Senate cut that out. So this is, this is eviction moratorium and foreclosure protections as we've discussed them. And we spent the last several hours discussing this piece on, on, um, foreclosure protections, trying to get this right and making sure that, that people aren't displaced, um, because of a foreclosure due to this due to this um, crisis, this has gotten a lot more complicated than what it than what we had originally. And I don't think it actually clarifies, in my opinion. So um, I'm very disturbed at this. We are we we are taking up this bill today. And in a short amount of time, we just, we've changed it substantially from what we had all agreed on. And I don't know if this, well, we have to vote on it, right? We're gonna take a vote on it. Mm -hmm. uh, Representative Hango, or Representative Triano first, please. Yeah, and I would just like, I just like to reinforce that when pro se litigants get in a courtroom before a judge, it is incredibly intimidating. And the more clear that we can make this statute, which I believe is what that this new section did uh, on, on section 4.1, uh, um, is a much better bill. And it's not that difficult to understand the language that we just incorporated in this for any, it shouldn't be for anyone in this committee. And the notion that uh, amendments are drafted or recommended by other people other than our committee uh, is really standard operating procedure, Lisa. And I just have to reinforce that this is a better bill for more people, for more Vermonters that will find themselves in court litigating these situations. And it is, it, 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 that's my opinion. So uh, that's what I'll wind up with. All right. Representative Hank, go. Thank you, Representative Troiano, for adding, this is my opinion to your statement, because it is your opinion, and this is my opinion. I'm not and, challenging that once it and that's way. And that's fine. Um, I just would like to request a clean copy of the entire bill so we can see what we're voting on. Yes. Thank you. Um, is that something that you need to see in order to understand it, or is it something to delay the vote? I absolutely take offense to that, Chair Stevens. I am not trying to delay this vote in any way, shape, or form. I'm actually trying to get clarity for those of us who don't quite uh, know what the exact bill is going to say. I have never in my short time at the legislature have voted on a bill that I haven't seen a clean copy for, and I'm going to choose to forget that you just said that about delaying the bill. Thank you. So the clean copy of the bill is what was sent to us in S-333. There is the separate amendment, version 4.1, that we just passed. Those are the two pieces. There's not like, and when we present this bill on the floor, it will be that we concur with further amendment. So if you, if are you asking a, the attorney and are you asking us to say that you need to see in order to, in order to make a vote, yes or no, that you need to see what the bill looks like with all of the language all put back in as if it's a finished vote after we vote on this on the floor? Is that what you're asking? 
I guess I'm asking to see, and maybe David Hall can point me in the right direction because our webpage has many different iterations, can point me to the two sections that the bill will look like when it's passed in its entirety. And, and that's typically what we do in committee to my recollection. But as you know, I have limited experience with this. So I'm just trying to understand the process. Yes, I'm sorry if you were offended by my comment. I'm just, I've made it clear that we need, that we do have a deadline. So if I'm, I apologize if you were offended by what I said. Um, Representative Gonzalez. I wonder, I wonder Representative Hango, if part of it is that since we haven't done um, many bills where we have um, a further amendment from the Senate on a Senate bill. And so if that's part of, in term, just in terms of the clarifying process and a new process, but um, because we are doing an amendment to a Senate bill, we don't typically get um, what the whole bill would look like after we had vote, after we had voting. So I think what you're asking for is more when we do a strike all. So when we do a strike all, um, and then everything gets put in to the bill so that it's easier to read, which is not what we're doing here. And so um, I, I think what, you, what I'm hearing you ask for is not something that, that we, we typically do unless we do a strike all and then it gets incorporated in. So I think it, it wouldn't be, what you're asking for isn't something that we would normally have. Okay, so Representative Gonzalez, that must be the teacher in you because that's exactly what I was looking for. Thank you very much, I appreciate yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Representative Kalaki. Uh, just procedurally, didn't we already have a, a move and a second on this? So shouldn't, I don't really understand, should we vote? Or I, I, what, what, it's just typical that we have discussions. Oh, well, we have a move and a, but, oh sorry. yeah, absolutely. Okay. No, abs, abs, absolutely, We're, we'll call the vote when discussion is over. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, any further comments? Does anybody else want to weigh on? And again, I, I totally appreciate that this is not an easy bill and, and this is not an easy section of law um, for us to get right. But I think we've gotten we've gotten to that point. And, um, and if we have no further questions, um, then the clerk may commence to call the roll. Okay. Um... Representative Triano. Yes. Oh, I lost my place here. <laughs> Representative Walls. Thank you for not forgetting me, Mary. Yes. I'm sorry. I was. <laughs> okay. Representative Gonzalez. Yes. Okay. Um, Representative Gamash. I choose Representative to abstain. Um, sorry, abstaining is not allowed in a vote like this. Uh, okay. Um, you want us to come back to you, Representative Gamash? Yes. Is that, would you like us yes, to come back to you? Yes, I want you to come back to me. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, Representative Howard votes yes. Representative Kalaki. Yes. Okay. Representative Zott. Can't hear you. Representative I'm Zott. sorry, I'm sorry, we can't hear you, Randall, even when you unmuted. Okay, that's a yes. Can you give me a thumbs up, please? Representative Byron. Yes. Representative Hango. No. And Representative Stevens. Yes. 
you need to go back to Representative Gamash. Yeah. Representative Gamash. Oh, crap. Um, this is very difficult. You understand, Marianne. At least I do. I'm truly okay. torn. Okay, can, can I, can, Marianne, can I just pause for a moment here? Sure. Um, sure. And just pause, and, Mar and Representative Howard, just pause. I'm sorry, I just got an email from David Hall, who took the time just now to put the amendment, this is what the bill will look like with the amendment, as if it were a strike all. Do we want to see that? I would like to see that. Okay, David, would you please share that with us? Just a moment, let me pull it up. Thank you. And thank you for doing that, David. Are you seeing highlight on your screen? Yes. Great. So what you have on your screen right now is S3333 as it came over from the Senate. And then I've threaded in the language from draft 4.1, the amendment. And so it, it, if you had structured this as um, a strike all amendment rather than what I usually refer to as a surgical amendment. So the surgical being, you know, first instance, second instance, third instances of amendment, which can be confusing to read. Um, a strike all would reproduce the bill in its entirety plus the changes that you're recommending. And so um, you would see here in section one, landlords and tenants, housing lenders, temporary housing related moratoria, you have our definitions in subsection A, you would be changing the definition of ejectment to add in the mobile home park resident. You would be adding to the definition of foreclosure, um, the caveat that the property actually be occupied. And then the language in subdivision B um, concerning what it means to be occupied. Um, and then the last piece is down in subsection D for new foreclosure and ejectment actions. And this is the timing issue during the emergency period, but after the effective date, you can commence the new action. So otherwise, with those three changes, you'll see the rest of the bill is as past the Senate. Um, so that's the compilation version. Okay. Um, um, committee, um, do you want this sent to your email boxes right now? We'll take a 10 minute, we can take a, t a 10 minute break and get back to it. Sure. I would appreciate that. Sure. Representative Hango, is that sufficient? Sorry, um, I already voted, so. No, I'm more than willing to allow people to change their vote if they are, if, if your answers, um, if you have answers to your questions, if you have an opportunity to review what David has done for us. Is that posted on our website, Ron? I, David can email this to, um, David, can you email this to the committee, please? And um, I have. 
All right, so it should be in your email box and we'll, Ron will post it as well. But do I, can I, uh, I can't see everybody nodding their heads or anything, but if basically, um, are people, are people okay if we take a few minutes for um, the committee to review the bill? Certainly. Sure, yes. Okay. So, so uh, the procedure for a break is that we ask everyone to turn off their cameras and mute themselves. Mm -hmm. And I will put up a sign saying that we're on break. So we're still live, but all that will be shown is a we're on break sign. Okay. okay. Um, it's 429 on my computer. Um, is 440 sufficient or 445? All right. Um, before we before we get back to voting, I just want to put it. Um, their discussion um, is still out there. Representative Gamash, you um, you were and and Hango in particular, you were able to read what would be a strike all amendment. Um, if you want to unmute. Um, and uh, if there's any further comments on this, um, we can, I, I can um, simply ask if we want to, if anyone wants to change their vote. We had one person who's, who hadn't voted yet and um, I'm, the floor is open if someone wanted to change their vote, it's not permanent until it's closed. So um, Representative Hengel, did you have any further comments on seeing the bill? in its current form as if as if it were a strike on. No, thank you. And thank you to David for doing that for us. Yes, that's over the thank you, David. That was really over the top and very good. Very nice of you to do that. Um, I appreciate it. And, and um, so representative, um, does any the representative, well, anybody does, let's finish the vote with representative Gamash. And um, oh, David learned a new a new trick. Um, the um, let's finish the vote with Representative Kamash, and then if anyone would like to change their vote, they can raise their hand, and we'll um, okay. We'll allow that. Representative um, Kamash. Yes. And does anyone choose to change their vote? Okay, seeing no one, seeing no one raise their hand. Nine zero one. No. No, no, I'm sorry. Nine one one. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's fair. So, um, Thank you, everybody. Um, again, I appreciate that this was a hard conversation and it's been, um, it is a unique circumstance, what we're trying to do here. And um, it's been difficult, but I appreciate you're sticking with it. And to this point, um, and we will get this to the clerk and um, move <laughs> it forward to the floor. To, we'll we'll work with you, Mary. Um, okay, thanks. <laughs> so um, again, everybody is um, unmuted except by choice here. If ever if does anybody have any further comments for today, we will have an agenda for next week. We are on two for for our committee. We have Tuesday meeting, and we have a Friday meeting. Um, that's been confirmed, Ron will send that out. And we were going to pick up a conversation as we discussed um, about what are we going to do come May 15th or starting on May 15th, if the stay at home order is, is expires. There was actually a very difficult article in today's Montpelier Bridge about what's been happening, at least as it's reported in the bridge um, that reflects a little bit of what we heard about how difficult it is up at the hilltop in in um, in Berlin across from the hospital, um, and, and so there's some issues that we really need to work on 
um, and discuss. And so we'll probably have um, a, a conversation with some of the housing community um, and with and with representatives from the administration, if we can get them, if they have time to start this conversation on our end. Yes, John, first, and then Deanna. You know, I, I, I appreciated uh, meeting with the, this, our Senate colleagues, and, and I thought that's helpful in the way we did this bill. It was, I think, terrific together. Um, my sense is that we have gotten more information about the 1,500 people who are in uh, these temporary housing in the hotels with the 200 children than the Senate, and May 15th is coming up. So I really think that we have to um, find, we have to really move that forward, something. I don't even know what the, it is, but we also have to move it forward with our Senate colleagues uh, because they're, they were looking at, oh, housing issues. They were looking at homelessness issues. And I think that, you know, we, We've just gone further in depth about that and this precipice of May, if it's May 15th, whatever happens to these 1500 people is a, a very dangerous moment and it's coming up. And so I, I am very anxious about this timeline with it, with our community that, that our, our, so I, I hope that we can either do that, that learning with ourselves and build on that, or if we can, include our Senate colleagues to get their attention to it. Because when, you know, they were saying, well, we don't know what's happened in our county. It's like, well, we actually have the statistics now in our committee. So I just, um, I don't, I'm just, I, I think I'm agreeing with you, Chair, about that that's a big issue for us, but I don't know how to get it in concert with our Senate colleagues at the same time, because we have about a week and well, and there's there's that conversation, and there's like, how can we use the existing housing community, who can, you know, I mean, for for those of us who have been on and looking at Tommy and Deanna, and Mary in particular, but folks who have been on this committee, and I think Chip through his work in human services has seen the stresses for years that we've been feel like we're yelling into the wind and trying to say if we could just do this, then that can happen, and here it is all of a sudden. Um, all of it coming into one place that's um, it's not going to get solved immediately either but I think it is um, going to be shocking to people when they understand what our world is and and you know getting the housing community to join in with their real knowledge um, will probably be an important part of this conversation as well but yes it was kind of it was kind of interesting to see the Senate just go yeah whatever you guys want to do um, but also we need their we need their participation um, yeah. Yeah. to make sure that to make sure it's not a typical House and Senate um, back and forth. Um, uh, Representative Gonzalez. It's a procedural thing. So you, um, you said, Chair, that we're meeting on Friday. Do we know what time we're meeting on Friday? Um, 12, uh, 12 to 2 on Friday. Okay. And then our Tuesday is the same time that we've been having? 11 to 1. Yeah. And that changed primarily because of the um, expected floor times. So things got shifted around. I think floor is on, two, is on when is floor on Wednesday and Thursday? Uh, floor, I don't, is, uh, there are two floor sessions on Wednesday uh, and one floor session on Friday. On Friday, okay. In the morning from uh, 10 a.m. I assume to noon on Friday. And then we're at noon to two on Friday. You said so. Correct. Um, okay. So, um, so yeah. That I mean, it, it, that's where we are. We're kind of, we're kind of, um, and and what that portends for the next couple of weeks in terms of what we're going to discuss and what we're going to hear about. Um, I mean, I'll we'll work with leadership. We'll work with the Senate. I'll work with. Um, I'll check in with Senator Sorokin, and see where we go from here. But. Um, yeah, this is this is a big issue, and the price tag. I mean, if we're concerned about the price tag, which I think we need to identify what the issues are, what the short and medium and long term issues are, and let the price tag follow. Um, but I think we're uniquely situated because this is, after all, what we've been dealing with, and, and in conjunction with Human Services, with uh, Department of Corrections. I heard recently um, the issues coming out of the migrant 
population up north um, where where farms are going under and people may be losing homes or it's you know the question of whether they're um, contract workers or or undocumented i mean there's there's a lot of facets to this conversation that we have to try to nail and uh, what you you mentioned this montpelier newspaper but i didn't see it is can you send us the link or, or tell us what had happened yeah i'll try i'll try it was just a I, I was just reading it during their 10 minute break. It was just, a, um, I, I mean, I can't give any credibility because I don't know the writer, but it, it, I mean, what we heard, what we heard is that it was pretty tough up there, that there was, it, because it was a different situation than the Econo Lodge, right? The Econo Lodge was leased to the state and Good Samaritan Haven was given uh, the direction to take their people from from Barrie and Montpelier and bring them up to the Econo Lodge. The, the hilltop, however, has ha, it's not full of folks who have vouchers, but it, there's a huge portion of the population up there that have, have emergency vouchers that were issued either as cold weather exemptions or an extension of the cold weather extension voucher program and, and remember all of the all of the uh, qualifications had been dropped so anybody who needed one got one and you know the population of having uh, folks up there has been very difficult there's people who live in the hilltop as weekly or monthly rentals um, and certainly there's no daily turnover because there's no there's no there's no trade right now because no one can travel but um, it's created a very difficult, and, and, and the article portrays it as a difficult thing, and, and Good Samaritan is interviewed and talked about how difficult it is. Um, okay, so I'll try, I'll try to get that link out to you um, this evening. So, all right. Um, thank you for all your work this week. It was a long time on, this, on the computer. And, um, and if I don't see you again until Tuesday, um, enjoy your weekend. Um, we don't have floor tomorrow, so um, enjoy the break from, from the screen. And, and I'm, if it gets... I'm ending the live stream now. Thank you. All right, everybody.